Section 6 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies Part 6 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Between Fire and Water No narrative could possess more terrible interest than that which should tell in the simplest words the story of the many wonderful escapes from death in the awful conflagration of Chicago. That many persons perished in the burning is already known. That the number may have been hundreds is possible. God alone can ever know the manner or the agonies of their death. But of thousands of those who escaped from the awful cyclone of fire, the story is one that finds hardly a parallel in all human experience since the world began. The greater number of these terrible experiences occurred in the North Division. The more combustible nature of the buildings in that part of the city gave to the conflagration a wider sweep and a more rapid movement than in the South Division. Like a mighty line of battle, the conflagration extended its terrible banners of flame until the right rested on the lake, the left on the river. Then, advancing in one awful charge, it literally swept that portion of the city from the face of the earth. Nothing could penetrate that vast line of flame and live. Before it, sixty thousand men, women, and children fled for their lives. On the eastern side of the district, many persons fled to the lake shore, supposing that to be a place of entire safety. Many, indeed, were cut off by the rapidly advancing flames from the possibility of escape in any other direction. For nearly all who sought escape in that direction, the sequel proved that they had taken a fearful chance. The experience of Mr. Lambert Tree and family was in part that of many. Perceiving that his own house could not escape, Mr. Tree, with his wife and child and aged father, went to the residence of his father-in-law, Mr. McGee. The McGee residence occupied the center of a large enclosure, and was therefore regarded as a place of probable safety. But the very fact, that of its isolation from surrounding buildings, soon revealed that it was the most dangerous retreat that could have been chosen. The conflagration enveloped it completely on all sides before the house took fire. On the side opposite to the approaching flames, the square was enclosed by a high board fence without openings. On the front, the flames had already cut off all possibility of retreat. The only way of escape was toward the northeast, over the fence already mentioned, a barrier which three aged persons, a woman already fainting in the dense smoke, and a little child half suffocated, could not possibly scale. The fence, too, was on fire. The house was already enveloped in a shower of burning firebrands. A horrible death seemed to be the inevitable doom of the entire party. At this terrible juncture, a portion of the burning fence fell to the ground, opening a gateway from the fiery cul-de-sac. Through this opening, Mr. Tree, dragging his fainting wife and child, fled toward the lake. In the flight from the premises, the party became separated, Nothing more was seen of Mr. and Mrs. McGee until, on the following day, they were found on the prairie northwest of the city. In their flight, they had taken a different direction from the others, and had no choice but to hasten on before the advancing fire, until beyond the line of its horrible path. The aged couple passed the night of Monday on the open prairie. In an open space, sheltered by the walls of Lill's Brewery, Mr. Tree and his family, with some of their neighbors, again supposed themselves to be in a place of safety. But from this refuge they were also driven by the advancing flames. The intense heat drove them to the beach, and even into the water, in which many men, women, and children stood for an hour, throwing water over their clothing to prevent it taking fire from the flame and sparks, which a fierce wind drove toward them. In one instance, the dress of a lady actually took fire. The wearer, with great presence of mind, removed it from her person to the lake. The heat, ever and anon, enveloped the fugitives like hot blasts from the mouth of a furnace. Dense clouds of stifling smoke swept over them, threatening instant suffocation. Children fainted, and strong men could only breathe by keeping their faces to the ground, 
until some new air current, lifting the smoke or turning aside the fiery blast, gave temporary relief. The situation is described by those who experienced its horrors as one surpassing all possibilities of conception or belief. But the flames, finding at length no more to consume, swept on, and the fugitives were saved. Loss and Insurance It is impossible to ascertain in dollars and cents the precise amount of the loss. It is not, however, impossible to make a trustworthy approximation from actual and unimpeachable data. And preliminary thereto, it may be well to say that the 10,000 guesses at the aggregate loss, which one hears in every place, are mostly of the wildest and absurd character. The aggregate loss has been variously guessed to be two, three, four, five, and so on to eight or nine hundred millions of dollars. One will meet in an hour's walk among the ruins twenty intelligent men who will avow that not a dollar less than five hundred million dollars of property has been destroyed. This is nonsense. At the most liberal estimate, five hundred million dollars would cover the value of every particle of property of every kind that ever existed within the corporate limits of Chicago. It is certainly not all destroyed, nor a half, nor a third of it. A careful calculation will show that a hundred and fifty million dollars is a liberal estimate for the value that has been destroyed by the conflagration. The valuation of property for city taxation for the present year was in round numbers as follows. Real estate, including buildings. South Division, a hundred and ten million dollars. West Division, $87 million. North Division, $38 million. Total, $235 million. Personal Property, South Division, $40 million. West Division, $8 million. North Division, $5 million. Total, $53 million. The judgment of the most trustworthy experts is that the assessed valuation of real property is rather over than under two-thirds of actual cash value upon an average of the whole city, while that of personal property is probably rather under than over one-third of the actual cash value. Adding one-third to the real property and two-thirds to the personal and the total value of all the property in the city of Chicago before the fire was $469 million. How much of this value still remains? How much of it has the fire destroyed? Assessment District No. 1 included all the South Division north of 12th Street. The total valuation of land and buildings in that district was $64 million, about $40 million for the former and $24 million for the latter. Much the greater part of the personal property of the South Division was in that district, probably $35 million, total $99 million. Deducting $40 million for the land, and the loss, if everything else were destroyed, would be $60 million, according to the assessor's valuation. Or, if this be equal upon an average of real and personal estate to one-half the actual cash value, which is believed to be quite within the fact, an actual loss of $120 million. Similarly, the actual loss in the North Division is found to be in the vicinity of $30 million. But from this calculation must be deducted all of that unburnt portion of Assessment District No. 1, between 12th and Harrison Streets, and a small unburnt district in the northwest corner of the North Division. From it must also be deducted the value of all personal property saved from the fire. To it must be added the loss in the burnt district of the West Division. Thus, while the calculation does not assume the character of precision, it furnishes a trustworthy approximation, showing that $150 million will cover the entire destruction of property by the conflagration. A Survey by Streets no better idea of the losses can be obtained than can be got by going over a little in detail the area swept by the fire in the South Division. 
As yet, and for weeks and months to come, no one will be able to enumerate these losses accurately and elaborately. Beginning not with the point where the fire commenced, but at the main branch of the river for convenience, let us enumerate the streets, and as far as possible recall what was on them, what was bought and sold and stored there, and by whom they were occupied. And first, South Water Street was swept with destruction's besom, from the south branch to the lake. Here went down the lumber exchange, several elevators with their contents, almost innumerable houses stored with flour, with apples and butter, with lard and pork, poultry, farm products, garden vegetables, and on the east half of the street, on both sides, were wholesale houses, stored from cellar to attic with groceries, coarse and fine, with the products of Europe, the wines of Burgundy and the Rhine, coffees from South America, the West Indies and the Orient, teas piled high like a Canton storehouse, whiskies, the distilled essence of thousands of acres of Illinois corn. These, with all that was left of the Fort Dearborn buildings, were wiped out for the entire length of the street, with the peculiar paraphernalia of the street, the skids, the clogged and choked sidewalks through which buyers wended sinuous, where now, O oh consignees from the northwest, are the products of your labor? You may come in thousands, as you already have, to look after them, but they are consigned where no consignee or purchaser will ever see them, into oxygen and hydrogen, thin air. While pursuing its resistless way along this street, eating through the vegetables and poultry and fruits and provisions of the Northwest more rapidly than the carnivorous tooth of time aided by the forces of decay. The fires were also sweeping across the river. Next, take Lake Street. This street, which for twenty years has stood as the great business street of Chicago, was totally destroyed from end to end, from the lake to the river, with the contents of the houses. The principal hide and leather houses occupied the West End. Next came several heavy hardware and cutlery establishments, farm implement establishments and toy shops, some of the largest silver and plated ware establishments, clothing houses, large retail dry goods houses, and below Dearborn Street, both sides of the street were occupied for about a quarter of a mile with palatial marble-fronted rows where goods were sold only at wholesale, tall buildings whose shadows fell entirely across the street and terminated somewhat up the fronts of the opposite side. These, containing millions of dollars' worth of goods of all kinds, the labor of the loom, from sunny France, from Italy, from India and China, from the shops of old and of new England, were all consigned at last to the general limbo of total destruction. At the foot of this street stood several fine hotels, the Adams, the Richmond, and Massasoit houses, and the great railroad union depot, a marvel of magnitude and art, whose picture graces some of the school geographies. These, with the freight buildings and the warehouses beyond, almost to the mouth of the harbor, containing freight and stores, and grain in quantities that nobody knows, and probably never will, in the aggregate, were all consumed. Then Randolph Street followed. The Lind Block stands at the bridge, the solitary structure left out of all that was valuable, beautiful, or grand on this street. This was the street where the large hotels stood, the Sherman House, the Briggs House, the Metropolitan, the Madison, and several others, a large number of furniture establishments and toy establishments occupied the west end of the street, while the east end was devoted, like Lake Street, to wholesale houses, including the great auction houses, the museum, the Northwestern Engraving Company's building, and several wholesale grocery establishments, together with a miscellaneous business comprising retail establishments, banks, etc., which were all consigned to ruin with the rest. Washington Street, from the tunnel to the lake, comprised many of the best buildings in the city. It was largely devoted to banks, offices, insurance, and real estate dealers. On this street was the Second Presbyterian Church, the Union Bank Building, the Merchants Insurance Building, the Nevada House, the Opera House, St. James's Hotel, the First National Bank, 
the Board of Trade, and a large number of other equally fine blocks, almost all of which were marble fronts. Then all of Madison Street, from the lake to the bridge. Some of the famous buildings on this street were Farwell Hall, McVicker's Theater, the Morrison Block, Tribune Building, Stott Zeitung Building, and St. Mary's Church. The entire street was built up with blocks such as cannot be excelled in any city. Monroe Street, from river to lake, having upon it the Lombard Block, the post office, the Prairie Farmer Building, and a large number of the finest blocks in the city. Adams Street, with its cheaper buildings at the West End, its Academy of Design, with most of the works of art therein contained, its Temple of Swedenborg, the South Side Reservoir, and many other buildings, Quincy Street, with its Pacific Hotel, fast approaching completion, and its Palmer House, the pride of everybody, with its palaces and its dens of infamy and shame. Jackson Street, from the residences of the rich and the elegant Trinity Church on the east, to the less pretentious houses of the working class farther west, to the hundreds of dens and holes of darkness at the west, were illuminated and oxygenized. Van Buren Street, with its bridge, its magnificent railway depot, St. Paul's Church, the Academy of Science building, and its blocks of fine residences and acres of poor ones, were annihilated. Congress Street, with its elegant Second Congregational Church, Harrison Street, with its freight house, the Jones School Building, and everything else except the Methodist Church on Wabash Avenue, and the houses on Michigan Avenue, fell before the flames. And this was the most southern street which was burned from end to end, from the lake to the river. These east and west streets only comprise in their description a larger portion of the houses burned. On State Street stood the magnificent bookstores of Griggs and Company, Keene and Cook, and the Western News Company, Field and Lighter's Wholesale Dry Goods House, besides many large wholesale and retail carpet houses, jewelry establishments, and furniture houses. On Dearborn Street stood the Times and the Journal newspaper offices, the Dearborn Theater, and a considerable number of banks and large office blocks. La Salle Street was built up with many of the finest buildings to be found in the city. It was largely occupied by insurance agents, real estate brokers, lawyers, etc. Between Washington and Randolph Streets stood the courthouse, which of course shared the general ruin. These details are only given to aid the reader in obtaining approximate idea of the losses. Little was saved, except from those houses which were not attacked by the flames until several hours after it was seen to be inevitable that the city was doomed. Immense quantities of goods were piled upon Lake Park and upon the grounds of the Chicago Baseball Club. Pyramids of clothing, boots and shoes, dry goods and furniture, from the houses of the rich dwellers along Michigan Avenue, all of which fell prey to the destroyer. THE LOSS OF LIFE The loss of life, though smaller than could have been predicted in such an extended and such a rapid fire, can never yet be fully estimated. There have been charred remains at the morgue, which were almost unrecognizable as human bodies and as the ruins are lying from two to ten feet deep in places, it is impossible to say how many have been buried under them. The fact that but few of those who are prominently known are missing must not lead any to believe that there have not been many lost who would be missed only by an exceedingly small circle of friends to obscure themselves to attract much attention. The greatest loss of life was in the North Division, among the wooden buildings, where the billows of fire rolled along so rapidly that the victims were engulfed before they were aware that the fire had reached their neighborhood. The flames often jumped two or three blocks at once, as was the case at the waterworks and Lill's Brewery, which were on fire a long time before any of the adjoining buildings. At the waterworks, one man crawled into a twenty-inch pipe, which was lying in the street, and was burned to a crisp. 
To the death record should be added the mortality on the prairies of the northwestern part of the city, where many children and babes in arms, unsheltered and almost unprotected by garments, took cold in the rain of Monday night following the fire, and died from croup before help could be secured. End of section 6